Hello, welcome to another computer vision tutorial video. In the previous video, I looked at how to find a, a, an object of a certain color and find the average location of all the pixels of that color, which allows me to very easily track an object like this. And you can see I can kind of move this around and I'm tracking it. Now, <laughs> what I want to do in this next video is look at something related but a little bit different, to look at how do I find pixels that have changed. So in th this sense, I'm writing a motion detector. Motion is pixels that are changing, right? Because if everything is very still, none of the pixels are changing. But if I move, those green pixels are suddenly becoming the my skin color. And so my skin color pixels are suddenly becoming green pixels, that sort of thing. So I'm going to start with this code example. Ah, but before I do that, let's add just a little sort of simple optimization to it. We don't really have a speed issue. This is running very, very quickly. But this can, if, as you move to higher resolution, become an issue. I did mention he, in the previous video that this particular algorithm, right, I'm finding the distance. Seems weird. Distance between two colors. Where, well, you can think of this three-dimensional space as, that we live in as the, a color space. And each color, you know, the x-axis of this space being red and the y-axis being uh, green and the z-axis being blue. And so colors that are near each other in the space are more similar. So <clears throat> that's how this sort of idea of Euclidean distance works. But um, the truth is this, the distance function uses a square root. So I'm going to write my own function here, down here. I'm just going to call it distance uh, squared. And I'm going to give it uh, six arguments. Uh, <laughs> uh, whoops, this should be x2. And what I want is to get that distance, which is uh, x2 minus x1 uh, times x2 minus x1 plus, and then I want to do the same thing with y. So it's the difference between x, the x values, the difference between the y values, and the, distance and the difference between the z values, all of those values squared and added together. Now the actual distance formula would then take a square root of all of that, but I'm going to not do the square root. Thus this function is called distance squared. I'm calling it distance squared. And so I can just change this to this. And then what am I checking? I'm not checking against the threshold anymore, but I'm checking against the threshold squared. And now I don't have any square root function, which will make the code run a little bit faster. And this could also, I could eliminate having to square it by just like using the value that's already squared, but I'm making the point here. So you can see this works exactly the same way, same exact math, but I've eliminated a square root. Okay, now that I've done that, let's start moving on to thinking about um, thinking about how I can uh, sorry how I can do this frame differencing. Okay, so the first thing I need to deal with is the fact that I have this capture event right in a separate thread. The video library is calling this event function capture event every time there's a new image available from the camera. Video.read, here's a new image. Video.read, here's a new image. Video.read, here's a new image. So what I need to do is right before I get that new image, let me copy the previous image to save it. So I have the previous one and the current one. So what I want to do is add actually a P image object. I'm going to call it prev for previous. And then what I'm going to do here is say previous, previous equals create image, and I want it to be exactly the same dimensions as the video, and I want it to be an RGB image. So this is making a blank image in processing. And then right before I'm about to read that image, I want to say previous dot copy the video, and then uh, the copy function in processing says take, what the, what, take the pixels in the video and copy them to this particular image. But you can do all sorts of crazy stuff. Like you can take a little bit of this image and copy it here and stretch it out. But I'm not going to do anything that interesting. I'm literally just going to say copy the whole video onto the whole uh, previous image. So I'm giving it two rectangles. And so, and the other thing that's probably I, worth doing is saying update pixels. So this now I should have previous and the current video. So if we run this, let's just run this to make sure there are no errors. <laughs> My shoe is untied. Ooh, look, I have a knee. I've never, I don't think I've ever shown my knee in any of these videos before. And that'll get edited out. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so you can see this is still working, nothing's changed, but behind the scenes there's this previous image. 
So what I want to do now, actually, is change what I'm doing. Oh, and I'm, um, I think I might have messed up by not saving as. Let me do this right now. Uh, uh, um, uh, motion detection. So what I want to do right now is actually look at every pixel in the current image and compare it to the previous one. OK. So um, I'm, I'm going to lose this idea of a track color because I'm no longer uh, tracking a color. And instead, what I want to do here is I want to get not only the current color, but I want the previous color, which is from the previous image. And I'm going to call that R2, G2, B2. And then I can check the distance between those. I can check if they're less than some threshold. Um, uh, now this is a, a this is a difference threshold. How different do they have to be to be considered motion? And I'm going to leave all this average stuff in here because I'm going to use that in a moment. But just so you see it right now, what I'm going to actually do is say uh, load pixels. And uh, in here, I'm going to actually just draw to the pixels array of the display itself. And I can use that same location. And if it's a motion pixel, I'm going to set its color to white. Otherwise, set its color to black. And then at the very end, I'm going to say update pixels. So oops, uh, we don't have track color anymore. So now I'm going to run this and take a look at what happens. Come on, video, come alive. Oops, OK, we got an error. Previous color equals previous pixels location. Now, where did I miss? Ah, I never said previous load pixels. So because I'm going to look at the pixels of that previous image, just like I'm looking at the pixels of the video, I've got to actually call load pixels. OK, let's run this again. There's a lot of waiting here. <laughs> Come on, video. Ah, I still have an error. Uh, what did I miss there? Uh, array out of bounds exception. I don't see why I should have an array out of bounds exception. Back after a moment of debugging, there are two key issues that I had in my code um, that caused a lot of problems. Number one is something that's a little bit of a, a nuance to the, um, the way the processing video library works. But the video stuff is happening separately behind the scenes. Um, and by the time we get down to this line of code, the video actually, uh, the camera hasn't like opened its connection yet. So the video width and height doesn't actually exist. So I could be smarter about how I create that image. But I think just to get this example working right now, I'm just going to hard code in the width and the height. I know that my camera is giving me a 640 by 360 image. So I want my background image to be that as well. The other thing that I didn't notice I had as I went over here is, right, the current color is from the video. The previous color is from the previous image, the previous frame. <laughs> but I want those red, green, and blue second values to be not from current color, but from previous color. So I've got I've to fix that. And now that I have that, the other thing that I think might be necessary, or maybe it doesn't matter. Oh, I might have not had this in there. So I also make sure that I'm loading the video's pixels and the previous uh, pixels. And so now we should be able to see white pixels wherever there is no motion, meaning the, the, the pixel is the threat, the distance is less, and, and black pixels where there is motion. So let's take a look at that. And let me try to zoom in here so you can see what's going on. Come on, image. So you can see it's very, very white. And now you can see if my arm is very, very still. There is no motion. But if I move my arm, the pixels are black. So you can see around the edges, and I can kind of walk in. And you can even see, like, if I move the t-shirt around, uh, you can see this. And this would be a good time to see what happens with some dancing. Motion dance detection. <laughs> OK, uh, that was, <laughs> I thought you weren't expecting that. You ended up, and now you might be sorry you're watching this video. OK, um, so there's a couple more things I want to do with this. Number one, let me just show you something interesting about this. I, I sort of actually also weirdly feel like reversing that. So let's see the white as the black as the background and white pixels otherwise. Um, but one thing I want to show you is I'm actually, every time there's a new image from the video, I'm copying the previous one. But I could also, by the way, say, hey, let's take this code and just add it in mouse pressed. 
So what this is doing, you'll see in a second, is as this runs, <laughs> speed up here, you're going to see uh, it's all white. I could click, and it's, now it's all black. I'm going to click again. There's a lot of auto white balancing going on. You can see here that now it's just showing me pixels that are different from the background because it's memorized the background. You know, another way that I could make this a little bit more clear is at the end here, I could draw the video and draw the previous one. I'll make them kind of small at the top. This is going to make things a little bit more clear. Are you running? Run. Come on, computer vision time. <laughs> so you can see here now, this is what it's comparing. It's comparing you know, this image up here to the one on the right. And if I go like this, and then I move, you can see that's been out. Unfortunately, the camera auto white balanced. So if I had a camera that didn't auto white balance, you could see I could come back into my spot and try to find it. Oh, look, I can't get there. Ah, 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 no, I, I, oh, there I am. No, uh, OK. Anyway, you get the idea. So I could be out of the frame and save it. Now it's the background. Now that cup is shaking. It stopped shaking. Let's save it again. And I could move my arm in, and you can see I'm getting a really nice silhouette. So this is the kind of thing you can do also for getting silhouettes. But you want good lighting. It really helps to have a solid colored background. You don't need a green screen, but certainly that's helping the cause here. But really, you need a camera that's not going to do all this auto white balancing stuff. You can see how, it, how quickly it changes. OK, let's add one more thing to this now, which is that remember how we were looking for the average location of all of the red pixels? Well, I can now do exactly that here. I can say. Anytime you find a motion pixel, a pixel with a distance greater than some threshold, then also what I want is to see that particular pixel. And I'm going to fill it white with a black. OK, so let's make it, um, let's make it some like uh, pinkish color so we can really see it uh, and maybe make it a little bit bigger. So this is going to be interesting because what I'm going to do is look for the average area of motion. And let's see what that gets us. Oh, I didn't mean to have, oh, whoops. Uh, let, me, let me do a couple things here. Let's take these out. We don't need to look at those right now. And let's put this back in capture event. So we're always, always getting that previous frame. <laughs> Awkwardly standing while waiting for camera to start. OK, but you can see I'm going to move out of the frame and I can put my hand in here. You can see this is actually doing a pretty decent job of hand tracking because you know, it's not perfect by any means, but you get a sense because my hand is the thing that's moving. Now, if I stop moving, it's going to completely go away. But I could store that. One thing improvement I could make to this that I'll, uh, is I could keep that location as a global variable. And if there isn't any motion, I could stay where it was last. Let's add that. So let's make, that, let's make this average thing a global variable. And over here, what I'm going to do is only only alter it if there are at least, let's say, uh, 20 pixels that are 20 motion pixels. Otherwise, it'll stay where it was before, and let's always draw it. So this is just a slight improvement to this that I think will help uh, make it feel like it's doing something more along the lines of what you might expect or want it to do. So you can see I can move myself around. And uh, now 20, I guess, is not that much. I guess there's so many pixels there. Let's just say there are 200. I don't know what's a reasonable number. There's probably, you know, there's millions of pixels. So th these are probably like such incredibly low numbers that I'm using. Um, and you can see as I move. Anyway, you could play with these values <laughs> um, and get something that's doing something slightly better. But you can see that the other thing that I would do here, and since we're here, is I'm, gonna, um, I'm just going to add uh, a lerp x, a variable called lerp. I'm going to show you that you can use linear interpolation. I have a whole video all about lerp that, you, that I should link to from here. But I can say also the thing I can do is I can say, let me actually take a, a lerped point and always say, uh, ch -ch -ch -ch, and say lerp x equals lerp uh, between average x and lerp x. And actually, let me, I like to say lerp x first, I think. Uh, and then point 0.1. So what I'm doing is I'm always just going 10% of the way towards the new point, 
which is actually going to smooth things out quite a bit. And I encourage you to uh, look up my video about the lerp function, which would kind of explain how that algorithm works a bit more. Uh, and here we go, and that camera just went off. But uh, I'm going to turn that back on, and so you can see the sort of final result that we have here. And the final result that we have here is that I have something that's kind of smooth as, as I move my hand around. Where does it go to? <laughs> Why does it go somewhere else? I don't know. I have a bug in my program where it's like uh, leaving and going somewhere else. I kind of want to fix that. Um, oh, because it's adding all this stuff up. Ooh. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this needs to be average x. <laughs> I, I, I <laughs> it's adding up all those points, even and but only mo only dividing it by count when it gets above 300. So I get that like added thing when it's less than 200. That was terrible. So uh, what I want, actually, my global variable is to be uh, the actual, uh, I'll call this motion x, motion y. And I actually only want to update those, motion x and motion y. And then I want to lerp that. Oops. And this is now, I think, going to be a final version of this that works correctly. So I was always adding up all those values for the average, but then not calculating the average. And so that was making it go way off the screen. And you can see now I'm going to move off the screen. And you can see I have sort of a very rudimentary, like, you know, as long as I'm moving my hand around and I don't come in the scene, I'm kind of getting, uh, it's, it's kind of following me in a sort of like nicely interpolated way. OK, so you can see that opens up a lot of possibilities. If I'm in here, you know, it's going to kind of follow me around. I, I, I could turn my music back on, and I can do the pig dot dance. I am a magic pig dot manipulator. OK, that's, uh, hopefully you turned this off and you didn't have to experience that. Um, so this is now a second video where we've looked at um, kind of how you can use motion frame differencing to sort of track a point around the screen. And in the next video, I'm going to return back to where we were tracking just this cup and looking for the average amount of red pixels to actually thinking about this cup as a blob so that if I add a second blob, <laughs> second blob, we can track both of them individually. OK, thanks for watching. Goodbye.